Well, for this afternoon, they're going to be the views of Dr. Dennis Cuddy. And I know some people who I said they never listen to our program during the week, but they always tune in at this time on Friday because Dr. Cuddy is usually with us. And they appreciate his commentary, as do I. And we're going to be talking about his, as to the the Dr. Cuddy's latest book, The Power Elite, Who Are They and Their Future, Dr. Cuddy. Why don't we pick up the story about this small group of people who are really running the world and basically their agenda, their goal, and basically we've started, we've gone into their history, the background of these organizations that have been around for hundreds of years. You pick up the story, please. Okay, but uh, first I want to make a comment about something that uh, I usually do something relevant and I'll, uh, and it's relevant to what we're going to be talking about, the history uh, and future of this uh, group I call the Power Elite. Uh, sometimes uh, it's like a mystery. You can be looking right at something and not uh, not see it. You know, you see the you don't see the forest for all the trees. And there, there are any number of examples uh, of that. Uh, but uh, uh, one thing that uh, I've been saying over and over again is how the power elite wants to have a synthesis of Western capitalism and Eastern communism to form a world socialist government. And, of course, each nation has to become a uh, socialist first. And there, there are certain things about uh, communism uh, that have really been around a long time. And I, I, the credit often, if you call it that, is usually given to Karl Marx, but... I've given examples uh, last week of uh, how this how this works with uh, Francis Wright and New Harmony, uh, Indiana, the first commune here, and, and so forth. And uh, if if you think about it, you can actually see it uh, right in front of your eyes happening, but you you don't really recognize it. For example, if I was to say uh, there's uh, communism here in this country reaction would be, oh, that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, we're capitalists. And yeah, sure, President Obama is moving us more towards socialism, but what do you mean there's communism here? Well, if, if you stop and think about it, in the past I've given uh, at least uh, a, an example or two of how it's here, but you just don't, you don't recognize it. Uh, for example, uh, when I did an article some time ago about uh, there used to be young African Americans who would mow the lawns uh, in the, wherever their condominiums, and then they disappeared. And there were some uh, Hispanic workers that had taken their place. Now the Hispanic workers are they're, they're very hardworking people, and this isn't a comment on them. But what happened was, and I, I mentioned this some years ago, is if the young African American has a wife and child and just starting out in life, trying to get his get some money and experience so he can move up the, the ladder of success, he has to pay the whole utilities bill on his house. But if the uh, contractor gets these guest workers, say 10 of them, and he puts them in a house, in, in my case, in the southeast part of town, and there's three in a bedroom, there's three bedrooms, and there's one on a cot in the living room, and then they, they literally can survive on minimum wage. And if you stop and think about it, what they have there is a little commune. If you meet them at a grocery store somewhere, I say, what, what are you doing? Well, we're buying, you know, we're splitting this. The, each person contributed, you know, 25 cents, and we're buying the baking for some chili or something. And I say, well, what do you do? Well, we go home and there's this pot. And we put this pot on the stove and we fix it, and then we all eat for the pot. Well, this is typical of a commune. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. This is Dr. Stan and Chris, our guest this afternoon, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and he's simply pointing out that we have a great deal of 
communism in America today, and the average individual doesn't understand. Or well, they know that certainly we're adopting a lot of socialist programs, but this idea of communism, of course, basically we have far more communism or socialism in America than they ever had in Russia or that they have in China today. We've got the most wonderful communal society, and certainly, of course, it's all financed on deficit spending. We're spending about a trillion dollars a year now, more than we're taking in. Isn't that wonderful? Look at all the advantages and all the things we can do for the people, uh, certainly by providing money that the Federal Reserve System is making out of nothing. It took us actually uh, 200 years to accumulate $1 trillion in debt, but we have it great now. We can accumulate a $1 trillion in debt every year, and those supposed to the Republicans are, are going to mobilize and stop that, but they're really not, because you've got Socialist Party A and Socialist Party B, and they pretend to fight. Uh, but of course, they play the game, and the people honestly believe it's real. What certainly Dennis is simply pointing out that if you have certainly uh, uh, the Hispanics coming up from south of the border to work here, uh, they'll live ten in a small uh, home. Uh, they'll actually buy very economical food. They'll have uh, maybe uh, beans. They'll put them in a big pot, and all ten of them will eat the chili that comes out and pick up the story there. But Dennis, yeah, and so they have a communal pot. Uh, they might have a bathroom, the communal bathroom. Uh, they're stacked, you know, on a triple-decker bed in a small bedroom. And so basically that is their little commune. And there's more and more of them. It's not just the grass cutters. It's in construction business, fast foods, and so forth. And after their three years or whatever it is up, then the uh, contractor gets, you know, another uh, ten of them to come up and do the same sort of, sort of thing. And it's, it's similar with migrant workers. You have a lot of uh, people from south of the border coming up as migrant workers. And in that case, if you ever went to a migrant farm, you see this long building, sort of like a long hut. And they are stacked uh, in there, you know, one on top of the other, with bunk beds or uh, little cots right next to each other. And at one end of the place is like a stove where they put their pot. And at the other end of the, uh, the place is a, uh, a toilet. And that's their commune, the communal toilet, the communal pot, the communal hut. And so you, you have increasing over the years uh, what you can recognize as communal life. And so uh, it, there are often things that are right before your eyes that you, you don't even see it. And another example I've mentioned in the past is uh, if uh, you ask somebody about what they take, the mark of the beast, they say, oh, no. Hold that thought. Horrible. Hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment with Dr. Cuddy. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dr. Cuddy is talking about certainly the communal life that many of our migrant workers live here. And then he was talking certainly about the mark of the beast. And well, go ahead, Reddit. How does that fit into the story that's unfolding? Uh, well, it, again, it's a, a similar thing. You, you can look at a migrant hut. You can look at a small house where the uh, guest workers from South of Board have come, and just you, you don't see it, but that is a commune. And so the same thing, uh, the same principle of, uh, is at play where you can look at something and not even recognize it. Uh, for example, if someone were to say, well, you take this mark of the beast, uh, most of the people in America would say, no, you know, this is from the Bible and it's a horrible thing and so on. Uh, but yet, uh, at the same time, they can say, well, here's you, here's a nice little card. Uh, it's a credit card. It's all yours. It's got, uh, your number on it. Nobody else has this little number. And you hold it, uh, in your hand. And so it, it's not exactly the book of Revelation, but there's your number and it's in your hand. And, uh, you can buy and sell with it. And pretty soon it'll also be your ID uh, number for your computer and your cell phone, and they'll combine them all into one handy little handheld device, and that'll be it. And that, you know, that that'll be it. You won't even need a computer as such anymore. It'll be this little handheld device. Same thing with your cell phone. You can talk, talk in it. So Big Brother will know everything about you. You'll know all of your emails, and what kind of things you're looking at, uh, your purchases online. Uh, with your credit card, and all of it will have a single number that will be your number worldwide, and you'll have this number 
uh, in your hands. And and I, basically, of course, when they brought the Social Security cards in 1935-1936, a lot of people said, look, this is the mark of the beast. I mean, that's what it is. The, oh, no, we would never allow this never to be used for anything else. You can trust us. This is because we want to help people. Oh, we want to help the elderly. Why are you against helping the elderly? This might never will never be. You can trust us. We would not lie to you. We don't want to control people and number them. We simply want to be able to help the elderly. And you know what they were doing? They were lying. And they use those cards now and so often today when you had called. In fact, I called somebody today. They want to know the last four numbers, my Social Security number. And simply most of what's going on today is deceit and deception. And certainly I've heard uh, certainly the President of the United States go on to Jay Leno and say, we would not monitor your telephone calls. We're not listening to your monitor calls. All of this is a lie. And the President of the United States was lying on Jay Leno but when people hear that they want to believe that this nice looking handsome man is telling the truth but most of what we hear and most of what we see and tragically so much of what we believe just isn't true today go right ahead Dennis okay so uh, these are these are some of the things that are right before our eyes and uh, we, we don't even realize it and it's like the, the frog in the water you increase the water uh, temperature slowly and uh, you can cook the frog. If you plop him into boiling water, of course, he'd be scalded, jump out, and so on. But if you do it gradually, then you can ultimately uh, have uh, your, your frog legs or whatever you want. And so this is typical of the paralyte. And last week, uh, we had gotten up to the uh, 1870s in terms of their history. And I had mentioned about uh, the uh, secret society from Yale, Skull and Bones, formed in the early uh, 1830s, and uh, that was about the same time, the 1830s, that John Ruskin was matriculating at Oxford University in uh, 1836, and uh, he then later would start teaching at uh, Oxford, uh, and in the 1870s, he had a student, Cecil Rhodes, who was impressed by Ruskin's philosophy uh, that they were the best northern blood, that there should be more of them. Uh, populating the world, or at least directing the course uh, of the world. And uh, so Cecil Rhodes uh, would form a secret society in 1891 called the Society of the Elect, quote, to take the government of the whole world, in, in his own words. And so then you move up into the uh, early 1900s, and that's where a uh, hereditary power elite member, uh, John D. Rockefeller, had his agents in every hamlet in the land, and you can see uh, that in Thomas Lawson's uh, book called Frenzy Finance. You can see that on Google Books. And uh, in 1911, there was the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, a cartoon by Robert Miner, showing Rockefeller with his fellow uh, power league members like J.P. Morgan and uh, Andrew Carnegie and others welcoming Karl Marx's socialism. The book under Marx's arm is not communism, but it's socialism, uh, to Wall Street. And also, in 1911, uh, that same year, uh, lead agent uh, Colonel Edward Mandel House wrote his book, his famous book anonymously at first, but then he sort of uh, let it out that he was the author, called uh, Philip Drew Administrator. That was published uh, referring to a socialist future uh, to come. And uh, socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx is, is what the phrase was. That was what uh, House's book was about. And he was uh, President Wilson's chief advisor, and Wilson was aware of, quote, a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that you better not speak above your breath when you speak in condemnation of it. Now, one of the top members of Cecil Rhodes' uh, secret society was Lord Escher, and he uh, actually helped uh, get us into World War I. Uh, which, uh, of course, Colonel House said had to be fought, quote, in fierce and exaggerated form. Why? Well, that would be to bring about what uh, Tennyson, uh, Tennyson, uh, his desire to form a League of Nations, when I, I had mentioned earlier Tennyson's Parliament of Man and the Federation of the World, 
And the American people at that time rejected the league. Uh, so the, the next phase of the uh, dialectical... Well, let me just comment that uh, Tennyson wrote, For I dipped into the future, far as any eye could see, saw a vision of the world and all the wonder that would be. Heard the heavens filled with shouting and the rain to gouse they do, of the nations, every navies grappling into the central blue, till the war drums throb no longer, and the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man the federation of the world and that was the dream that was the dream that has motivated people as they end back in the 1840s that's the dream that motivates them to date uh, the whole idea of a world government and well, how do we go about that why well, we create wars and revolutions we create wars and revolutions so we can bring about world peace world war one world war two and world war three is coming and we're going to have to have world war three to get the parliament of man the Federation of the World? Uh, well, yeah, uh, there, there's a, a, uh, a particular strategy at work, and, and you can see it. Uh, the 1840s really was an interesting time. The uh, 1840s when to de Tocqueville uh, wrote uh, his book uh, about uh, America and the future of America, saying you know, what would per perhaps happen to us. If we weren't, uh, if we didn't remain vigilant, then 1842, of course, was Tennyson's uh, Locksley Hall, and then in 1844 uh, was uh, Disraeli's Conings Bay, the Next Generation, uh, where there's a quote in there about, so you see, my dear Conings Bay, that the world is uh, ruled by those uh, behind the scenes. And so you have this uh, whole track record of uh, people describing what's going to happen and the parallel eight is uh, you said uh, Lord Escher uh, I have uh, pages from his diary where he's meeting with uh, Morgenthau the the chief financial supporter of Woodrow Wilson and they're they're plotting uh, how American blood can be shed as soon as possible so that the US will enter into World War uh, one to as, uh, as he said uh, Escher said to steady the French. The French, French didn't want to get into that war in the first place, but uh, they were more or less bribed. I've mentioned this in previous uh, columns that I've had with news with views, and then on this show how uh, they bribed the French to uh, get into the war, and then of course Britain was in the war, and then we were. It was the Triple Alliance. They were the, the, the quote bad guys against uh, the Triple Entente, uh, which was the good guys, uh, the the allies, as it were. And so uh, they manipulate events and try to get us into uh, a war. They use uh, oftentimes a dialectical process. As I said, they want the synthesis of Eastern communism and Western capitalism into the uh, world socialist government. But at that time, uh, the American people uh, weren't uh, as, uh, as dumb as they are now, and the American public rejected uh, the idea of membership in the League of Nations. Uh, so the next uh, phase in the apparently dialectical synthesis uh, was the uh, creation uh, of uh, national socialism, which is what the word Nazi means. So they had created Karl Marx earlier in the 1840s, and now they created the national socialism of uh, the Nazis. And uh, Colonel House had uh, succeeded, of course, in getting uh, Woodrow Wilson to uh, sign the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, and the Fed was under the control of power elite members like J.P. Morgan, who would then go on to establish the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, that was in uh, 1930. And just three years later, in November of 1933, President Ru Franklin Roosevelt uh, wrote to Colonel House that they both knew, uh, House and, uh, and Roosevelt, they both knew the U.S. government was under the control of, quote, a financial element in our larger centers, end quote, ever since the days of uh, President Jackson. If anybody would like to see that letter, actually, I found that when I went to Colonel House's papers back at Yale. We offer that to anybody just to request it by calling us at 1-800-544-8927. And, and President Roosevelt says, as you and I both know, Colonel, why, of course, the, uh, our country is controlled by this little group of financiers. And basically, uh, uh, there is no question at all about it. I mean, this is writing, I think, in October of uh, 
uh, was that 1933? November 21, 1933. Okay, fine. So basically the documentation is there. I mean, suddenly Roosevelt didn't understand that his closest friend, the man who is uh, suddenly he met with on a regular basis, Colonel House, was working for the very people he opposed. To. Oh, but of course uh, this happened in Sydney. I said that Colonel House controlled Woodrow Wilson. Colonel House controlled FDR because he had supernatural power. And until you understand that behind everything going on are people who Sydney who do have this ability to control the minds and reality of others. Our guest is Dr. Dennis Cuddy and Sydney going to the background of the forces that brought us to where we are today. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Okay. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that uh, frenzy finance from 1904, uh, where Thomas Lawson is talking about uh, the, the power leads and there's no place on earth you can escape from them if you cross them. And as a, a side note, uh, Colonel House's granddaughter had been involved uh, with uh, some of the higher level financial elements, as Woodrow Wilson uh, called them, in this country. And she uh, let the beans spill, as it were, about the goal, which was in Fort Knox. It's actually been moved. It was not 99% pure gold anymore. It was sort of this copper gold. And the next thing you know, she takes a header out of her, uh, I think about the sixth floor window in a hotel and, and dies. And so uh, they they have a long reach uh, when, they, when they want to. And so uh, what she had here was... Uh, J.P. Morgan and others uh, basically putting up money to get uh, the French and others to participate in the First World War, and uh, we put forth various false uh, stories about the, the Germans at the time, and, and the Germans actually tried to uh, have people not get on the Lusit Lusitania, uh, but the only paper that printed it was the Des Moines Register, and so uh, what you have is the... Uh, J.P. Morgan and those individuals, after the stock market crashes and Black Friday in 1929, you have them setting up an international bank called the Bank for International Settlements. And that's, uh, that's the central bank of all the world's central banks. And beginning uh, in the 1930s, it came, the bank came under the control of the Nazis, uh, even when American, yeah, an American named Thomas Patrick uh, was heading it up. Uh, from 1940 to 46, it was still under the control of the Nazis. And in 1933, uh, there was a book called The Shape of Things to Come. In there, uh, a paralyzed agent, he's not a member, he's an agent of theirs, H.G. Wells, uh, wrote that a second world war would begin around 1939. And in that year, his new, uh, his new world order, uh, the new world order indicated in Tennyson's, uh, world state would come from a conference in Basra, Iraq. So uh, it's not really clear exactly what comes first or whatever, but there will probably be some sort of conference in Basra, Iraq. That's what our effort into Iraq was pretty much all about. And since uh, these individuals like Wells are British and MI6 is involved in the hereditary elite over many, many centuries, has to do with uh, Britain, that's why it's interesting that when uh, we went into Iraq some years ago, we took over the primarily the large part of the country, including Baghdad and so on. However, the British were in control of Basra. British were in control of Basra. So that makes it very, very convenient uh, down the road, of course, to have this World State Conference in, in uh, Basra, Iraq. And so uh, what, you, uh, what you have is uh, the effort... Uh, on the part of these individuals to look ahead, plan ahead, or in Wells' case, to, to find out uh, what was going to help and what was going to happen. And he said uh, that uh, there would be a, a Second World War in about five or so years, from 1933, and sure enough, uh, there was. World War II began then. And uh, he also knew that there would be this second attempt uh, regarding the establishment of a world government, uh, and the second attempt would be the U.N. at the end of World War II. 
uh, to bring about uh, Tennyson's dream. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Well, this is Dr. Stan. It's like Dr. Cuddy is simply talking about how everything going on behind the scenes has always been aimed at bringing about this world government, how we've been taken from one phony war to another. For instance, simply the Gulf of Tonkin incident, you know, got us into Vietnam. Oh, my goodness, they just shot one of our uh, ships there. You know, we got to punish those, those nasty North Vietnamese. We killed 58 thousand American boys, a million South Vietnamese, two million North Vietnamese, then it turned out it was all a lie. I mean, it never occurred. And the same thing, uh, we had to attack Iraq back in 2003 because Saddam had all those nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction and boy, we had to protect the world from Saddam Hussein. It was all a lie. And basically because you saw this just a few weeks ago when Barack Obama lied to the American people about the attacks, certainly the chemical attacks that took place there in Damascus, saying that Assad, President Assad of Syria, had done it. Well, the U.N. report came out and said, yeah, there was chemical weapons used, but we don't know who used them. But they were going to take us in and kill a lot more people. We've already killed 100,000 people in Syria, but does anybody really care? If we stop funding the rebels there tomorrow, the killing would stop day after tomorrow. If we killed a half a million people in Libya, and suddenly with our funding of the rebels there, half a million people, you're not going to hear about that the regular channels. At least they'll admit the carnage that's taking place in Syria. And they said Assad's doing it. Assad simply is defending his country from the financed rebels, the mercenaries that we're sending in there. About 80,000 mercenaries we're paying for them with American tax money. Fortunately, fortunately, the American people are getting smarter, and they didn't want to go along with it. Not only that, uh, certainly the Arab League wouldn't go along with it. Barack Obama's plan to attack Syria. Why NATO wouldn't go along with it. Even England wouldn't go along with it. The British Parliament wouldn't go along with it. I said they there weren't any support in Congress for it. And so they had to back down. One of the first times I've ever seen them backing down. Usually they have such control over the media. They can convince us of all sorts of things that aren't true. They weren't able to this time. Now they're, of course, going to find another excuse for expanding the war in the Middle East. But go right ahead. Uh, yeah, notice how quickly the, the situations change. Uh, uh, for a while, years ago, there was uh, a great deal of news about the Contras, you know, versus the Sandinistas, and then all of a sudden it just stopped. You, you know, you wonder, well, what what they moved on to the next crisis, whatever they wanted to scare us with, and you, you would scratch your head and say, well, I wonder what happened to that conflict afterwards. And so uh, what you have here in Syria is the same thing. It's built... It's building and building to a fever pitch, and something's got to be done, and we're in a crisis moment, and we just can't let this go on, and, and we're going to have to teach them a lesson, and it may be a limited strike and so forth. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, supposedly Putin uh, says, well, uh, they can give their chemical weapons to us. And uh, then uh, what happens is President Obama says, well, you know, this is, this is good news and so forth and so on. But if you step back and say, well, what just happened? Well, what just happened was a shift from rebel support to oust the side, and now, of course, who is it that is going to have to manage the dismantling of the chemical weapon? Assad. So in a very, very clever way, he has actually gotten us to protect him, to protect him, because he's the one who's going to be in charge of identifying where these places are, and they're dismantling, and they'll have to be overseen. It's going to take a year or two or, or whatever it is. So right now, the, the whole thing has shifted without the public seeing it from one of, well, Assad's got to go, we're going to get rid of him, that's it, it's imminent, it's immediate, we're going to do it, we're going to strike uh, any moment now, to all of a sudden now we're practically guaranteeing that Assad stay in power. And so, you know, it's, it's the exact opposite of what it had been the day before. The day before, he has to go, we're going to move in. Now, because he's supposedly going to give up all of his chemical weapons, now we're going to guarantee that he does stay so that he can tell us where they are and manage their dismantlement. So, they, you see, it's, they're very clever at these tactics that they use. And so the point I was at before about uh, uh, Basra uh, Iraq, according to H.G. Wells, would, uh, in the 50 years or so, when he wrote it down in 1940, uh, be the center of what he called the World Federation. He called it the world government, but World uh, Federation. And that would bring about what Tennyson had asked for, his dream of the uh, 
a basically the parliament of man in the federation of the world. And so uh, what they did uh, was they had, as I said, uh, developed and created uh, communism and Marxism. And so during the 1920s, uh, they a little earlier, but in that that whole period, they developed uh, Nazism, which simply means national socialism, uh, so that they could then have all the nations of the world socialists and link them up in the world socialist government. And ladies and gentlemen, if you've never heard certainly of Operation Paperclip, you need to look it up. That's how we helped the Nazis come to America after the war. About a thousand of them. The Rat Line R A T. That's how we helped ten to thirty or forty thousand Nazis escape to South America and helped aid. Of Hitler escape. You say that couldn't be true? Well, fortunately, we do have the internet, the alternative media, and it is true. Well, this is Dr. Stan. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, so, what you have at this time after they created Nazism. Uh, you have the brains of the uh, Nazi movement. There would be Himmler and Bormann and some of the German general staff members uh, developing a secret plan whereby they would lose World War II, but not immediately. It would be over several years, which they did. And uh, what they would do is control much of the world's economy within, they said, about two generations, which would make it uh, about now. And that would fit. That would fit with what uh, Cecil Rhodes had said uh, back in the late 1800s, where they wanted to have this secret society scheme to take the government of the whole world, and they would be absorbing the wealth of the world, absorbing the wealth of the world, and that's just uh, exactly what uh, Borman and Hamlet, to some extent, were, were doing under this uh, secret plan about two generations from then, which would be uh, right about now, and they continued, the Nazis continued their alliance with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood beginning in the 1930s uh, up until today. And so you can you can see how this thing uh, comes about, and this unfolding, and these various incidents. And uh, relevant to the Paralites' uh, plan for a world socialist government uh, through this dialectical process of uh, Western capitalism, Eastern communism, uh, an example of that uh, occurring in their own words, so to speak, uh, would be Ford Foundation President H. Rowan Gaither telling a congressional a research committee, a research director, Norman Dodd, that they, they the, uh, the people there at the Ford Foundation, uh, were under directives from the White House to so alter American life as to bring about a comfortable merger, is the way you put it, a comfortable merger with uh, the uh, U.S. and the, the Soviet Union. And similarly, a few years later, in 1962, uh, when uh, CFR member Lincoln Bloomfield uh, wrote a report uh, for Secretary of State Dean Rusk, who was a Rhodes Scholar, the Rhodes Secret Society, Rhodes Scholars, uh, indicating that, quote, if the communist dynamic was greatly abated, the West would, might might lose whatever incentive it has for world government, end quote. And so that was what uh, he, he strategized. You have to have that opposition. You have to have that anti- antithesis uh, to go with the synthesis so that you can then have your compromise of a world, uh, a world socialist government. And now... Uh, I want you to hold on there. We're going to be back here in just a moment with Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Well, this is Dr. Stan here, and suddenly Dr. Cuddy is simply talking about so many of the things that have happened. People never hear about them because the information is suppressed. But he was talking about a conversation that took place between Rowan Gaither, who is the president of the Ford Foundation, and Norman Dodd, who is, of course, the director of research for the Reese Committee, who I had the privilege of interviewing back in 1980. And what did Rowan Gaither tell Norman Dodd that was so incredible? Uh, he said that uh, they were operating under directives from the, the White House. And this is began, began, he said, when uh, they had been members of the OSS and so on. So we know at least from his perspective, it at least began under FDR's time, because that's when it was still known as the OSS before it became the CIA. They were, to, uh, they were under directives from the White House to so alter American life as to bring about a, quote, comfortable merger of the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And because that is quite an incredible statement, but if you'd like to actually hear Norman Dodd tell the story, you can get our DVD. It's entitled The Dangerous Deception. I interviewed Norman Dodd in 1980, and he tells the story of how Ro- Rowan Gaither, president of the Ford Foundation, says that they are operating under presidential directive to so alter life in America that one day we can be peacefully merged with the 
the Soviet Union. And Norman Dodd says, well, will you tell the American people that? And Rowan Gaither says, of course not. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you're not supposed to know what's really going on. Have you ever simply noticed how well suddenly we seem to get along with Putin sometimes and then other times? Why the president's at odds with him? And, and so many times, of course, the background today, well, until recently, Russia has been the largest producer of oil and natural gas in the world. How did they get to be the largest producer of oil and natural gas in the world? Why we went over there, we provided the money, we provided the technology, and the companies that built the oil wells, drilled the oil and natural gas wells from Russia. But you're never going to hear that through regular channels. You go to my website, read my newsletters, and we give you all the documentation on it. How did Russia, this backward country, be able to drill all these oil wells and all these natural gas wells why we did so that one day we could peacefully merge with the Soviet Union well we're probably going to have a few wars with them between now and then but this is all contrived ladies and gentlemen millions of people die we've killed a hundred thousand in Syria we killed half a million in Libya but does anybody really care go right ahead Dr. Cuddy uh, uh, right and so the, uh, the communist dynamic that uh, Lincoln Bloomfield was talking about in his report to Dean Rusk, at that time expressed itself uh, in the Vietnam War uh, involving the West against uh, ultimately the Soviet and Chinese communists. And the Chinese communists, uh, of course, were brought to power in 1949 by a parallel agent, uh, General George Marshall. Uh, and so uh, you had the Soviet Union and China, and of course, the, the, the actual fighting went on with their proxies against the U.S., that would be the North Vietnamese and the, the Viet Cong. And this was simply another example, Vietnam, of another no-win war, just like the Korean War had been, uh, that reduced the support of uh, nationalistic patriotism in this country, especially a young, uh, American, uh, young American adult. And, uh, of course, uh, the, the other thing that happens during these wars is uh, and most wars, it kills off many of the strongest uh, young patriotic uh, men. And so it has a twofold purpose. Not only do you reduce the population, but it's a particular type of the population that you're getting rid of. And let me just comment. I interviewed both uh, a four-star Marine General Lou Walt and so the ambassador, uh, the, the General Sullivan, William A. Sullivan, American ambassador to both uh, uh, Laos and uh, Iraq. Uh, pardon me, uh, both uh, Laos and. Um, Vietnam. Iraq, he was Iraq. And basically they both told me we could have won the Vietnam War in six weeks if they just let us invade North Vietnam. And as Ambassador Sullivan said, I never didn't understand why we never tried to win the war. Well, okay, so if you won the war, why well, you wouldn't be able to kill all those people? You wouldn't have this as a wonderful distraction. The purpose of Vietnam was a distraction so they could bring in the great society and socialism to America. That's what it was all about. You read their writings. January 1967, Foreign Affairs Magazine, Mick George Bundy, he says exactly that. I mean, so that this is the distraction. Don't never say that we ought to pull out of Vietnam. The, the opposite is the case. The road forward at home is by persistence and Vietnam. January 1967, Foreign Affairs Magazine. Nobody will ever quote that because the last thing they want you to know is we killed 58,000 American boys, a million South Vietnamese and two million North Vietnamese as a distraction so we could bring in the great society. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, and uh, what, you, what you find is that uh, 1967 was also interesting because at the same time what what you're saying in uh, the October 1967 edition of uh, the Council of Foreign Relations Journal, which is uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, Richard Nixon, who's supposedly you know a conservative, he wrote uh, about these regional arrangements that would evolve into a new world order, regional arrangements, and then later on that same theme was picked up by Spignev Brzezinski at uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's first State of the World Forum, that was in 1995, where Brzezinski declared, uh, quote, we cannot leap into world government through one quick step. The precondition for eventual and genuine globalization is r progressive regionalization, uh, because by that we move toward larger, more stable, more cooperative uh, units, end quote. And so this, this shows how over time they have this long-range strategy, and then Brzezinski, of course, in 1973, 
He became the uh, first uh, director for the Trilateral Commission, established by uh, paralegal member David Rockefeller. And uh, he would work uh, with various uh, communist dictators over the years, uh, Mao Zedong and, and others. And uh, this also fit uh, within the parallel dialectical process uh, because while David Rockefeller worked with the communists, his brother Nelson had uh, worked with the, uh, with the Nazis. And uh, after that period of time, the 70s, Ronald Reagan became uh, president in 1980. Uh, the dialectical movement uh, toward a comfortable merger of the U.S. and USSR continued as uh, Reagan decreasingly referred to the Soviet Union as an evil, uh, evil empire. Uh, so uh, at that point, they uh, had a change and started under President Reagan to implement these various agreements, such as uh, when I was up there in education, the 1986 Soviet-American Exchange Agreement. And uh, they negotiated that with Gorbachev after uh, Gorby had become uh, General Secretary of the Soviet Union in March of uh, 1985. And so he comes in to present this new face, you know, perestroika and glasnost and all those uh, slogans uh, that he had. And then, of course, George H.W. Bush succeeded uh, President Reagan. And in 1990, he emphasized the need for a, quote, new world order, end quote. Uh, Gorbachev uh, followed that with his own uh, May, uh, May 2, uh, 1992 speech in this country, in Fulton, Missouri, in which he said the following, uh, and some of this was uh, not printed in the American press. They picked up a few tidbits of it, but not the whole thing. And this is what he said, quote, This is not just some ordinary stage of development like many others in world history. An awareness of the need of some kind of global government is gaining ground. A powerful process of technical and political internationalization is taking place, end quote. And so uh, that's what the full, in Fulton, Missouri, Gorbachev said when he came over here. And at the end of 1992, uh, Bill Clinton was elected president, of course. And uh, as a Rhodes Scholar, he, uh, he supported a world government, uh, which was longed for by Cecil Rhodes, uh, of course. And in keeping uh, with the regionalism first strategy of the parallel, uh, NAFTA was begun in January of 1994, just two months after the European Union. Uh, was formed uh, November of uh, 1993. And the current economic crisis uh, in the, EU, uh, the EU, uh, European Union, uh, is to, I, I think, to coerce its members to take the next step in this uh, plan that the Paralit uh, has hatched, uh, which be, would be, of course, a fiscal, fiscal union in uh, the United States of Europe, we'll call it. It's a, you know, a new name. The, the borders would probably still be there, but, you know, they, they wouldn't be as meaningful because there would be now this region and then ultimately a, a one-world uh, concept. So uh, at uh, his address, his speech, to the Masonic Peace Conference in Paris in 1849, remember this, this plan goes way back, uh, Victor Hugo had said, quote, let us have a United States of Europe. Let us have a continental federation, end quote. And, uh, again, similarly in Lenin's, uh, it was, it, the title of it was Collected Works. If you look at volume 21, he, uh, Lenin, called for a United States of Europe, including Russia, uh, as did Stalin. Uh, Stalin did that in 1926. And then Winston Churchill also had an essay titled, uh, quote, The United States of Europe, quote, published in the Saturday Evening Post. And you can find that, uh, at the Post website. February 15th, uh, 1930. And I think what people have to understand is the motivation is we want to do away with war. So that's why we have to sort of unite this world and that. And how do you go about it? Why do you do it? By fighting war after war after war. World War I, World War II, Vietnam. And so now, of course, we're doing everything we can to build up the Muslim Brotherhood, break down the governments over there, centralize power with the radical Islamists, finance the terrorists, finance al-Qaeda. We, we we actually fight them in say, Afghanistan, and we finance them in Syria and Libya and Tunisia and Egypt. We finance these radical Islamists, creating the best enemy they could buy in preparation for the next war. It's a, not a matter of if, but when it's coming. Go right ahead, Dennis. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, Winston Churchill had this essay, United States of Europe, uh, published as early uh, in the Saturday Evening Post as early as 1930. And then later on, he picked that theme up again, uh, echoing his call for uh, this uh, United States of Europe in the October uh, 1942. He echoed that uh, to his cabinet, told them about that. And in Zurich also, he said the same thing in 1946. So this is an ongoing theme, and if you move the uh, the theme uh, somewhat forward, what you find in Germany is uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel on June 4th, 2012, pronounced, quote, we need more Europe, not less, end quote. And in uh, this, this is the title of an online article. The title is, Europe's foreign ministers want more power for EU. Uh, that was in something called the Welt, W-E-L-T, Welt Online. June 21, uh, 2012, and uh, one finds it there that among the uh, interim recommendations of the what they call the future group uh, on the European Union, uh, there are also uh, some some provisions for a directly elected uh, EU president, uh, the creation of an EU army, and uh, of course uh, European rather than national uh, visas and more uh, direct control of national budgets. And so that's, that's what happens. Is that once you get all of those things, uh, you start to undermine national sovereignty, which is what uh, was told uh, by uh, the leading world historian of the 1900s, early 1900s, uh, Arnold, uh, Arnold Toynbee. And so you, you undermine national sovereignty by doing these sorts of things. So that's what the, the future group on the EU was uh, talking about and planning. And uh, George uh, W. Bush then was elected president in the year 2000, uh, following Bill Clinton's uh, two terms. And his secretary of education, Bush's secretary of education, was a Rod Page, B-A-I, a G-E. And Octo- on October 3, uh, 2003, he, a Rod Page, declared that the U.S. was pleased to rejoin UNESCO, where we could develop uh, common strategies to prepare our children uh, to become, quote, citizens of the world, end quote. And that's the title that you may recall, the listener may recall, Barack Obama, uh, who was elected president in 2008, and would use to identify himself. He would use that to identify himself, this, uh, this classic uh, terminology that they, were, that they were using at that time, a citizen of the world, and they're still using it today. And so it was then uh, about the beginning of this, this new century, at that time, 21st century, uh, which Aldous Huxley, in his book uh, Brave New World, uh, said would be, quote, the era of world controllers. The era, E-R-A, era of world controllers. So he, he once, uh, once again, sort of knew what was coming down the pike and what was going to be, uh, what would happen to uh, us. Uh, confirming this uh, was the Paralink uh, member, David Rockefeller, uh, in his startling admission, which we don't have to go into, but uh, Dr. Stans mentioned it many times. If you look at his book, Memoirs, published in 2002, you look at uh, a little, you know, toward the back of the book. It's a rather thick book. If you look at page 405, you have him uh, giving uh, that admission that he's uh, part of a secret cabal, which is, quote, conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated political and economic structure, one world, if you will. And that uh, the cabal is a secret, of course, uh, means that its uh, members are not all known. So, you know, I mean, how how do I or anybody else get to get in touch with them? Because it's secret. And that uh, that the cabal is a uh, secret uh, means its uh, membership is not known, so you can't find out who they are. And at the beginning of the prologue in Nicholas Hagger's book, H-A-G-G-E-R, Hagger's book called The Syndicate, The Story of the Coming World Government, that came out in 2004, he revealed that the Queen of England is alleged to have told her brother, I mean her butler, uh, Paul Burrell, a few months after Princess Diana's death in a car crash, August 31, 1997, the declaration was, quote, be careful, there are powers at work in this country, Britain, about which we have no knowledge, in quote. And so this is a very powerful group that sits above kings and queens. And uh, in following the parallel strategy 
of using a dialectical process uh, to, uh, by you know, regionalization, to achieve this world socialist government. Uh, Barack Obama, of course, was elected president in the year 2008, and uh, with his Muslim background, he, of course, uh, would have been would be able to relate to the Muslim revolutionary uprisings uh, in North Africa and uh, and the Middle East, beginning in 2011. And he made uh, he made presidential overtures to the Muslim Brotherhood uh, from uh, the beginning of his administration, and as the uh, the Brotherhood was leading organizational structure in these uh, revolutions in that part of the world, they would be, of course, in a unique uh, cross-countries position to facilitate uh, the regionalization of the uh, nations involved, at least e- economically. Well, uh, President Obama uh, could also then uh, move the U.S., just like uh, they did uh, earlier in the century, move the U.S. increasingly toward socialism which would be necessary for uh, an eventual, quote, comfortable merger, that's the term I've been using, which is what Norman Dodd heard Atro and Gaither say. Uh, so there would be this eventual, eventual uh, comfortable uh, merger with the socialist regions of the Europe and uh, Latin America. Uh, and uh, he, he was elected, re-elected, uh, with an October surprise in November of 2012. He could uh, be followed then as president uh, by his brother, Chip uh, Bush, in 2016, in time to accept the Phoenix, that's what I call it, as the new world currency plan for 2018. Hold that thought, Dennis. We'll be back in just a moment. I guess Dr. Dennis Scuddy. Uh, Dennis, we've got about three minutes here to wrap up the program. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, my, uh, my looking down the road uh, sees that the economy, the economy may not be too bad this year or next year, but after the 2014 election, it'll start to uh, deteriorate and uh, really, uh, really go uh, downhill. And so because there's this downhill movement of the crash or whatever you want to call it, uh, then it's uh, very logical that the phoenix bird, which rose mythologically rising from the ashes, uh, would be used. The phoenix as the new world currency, which is planned for uh, for the uh, time of 2018. And that was, you can also see, and I put a copy of the cover of The Economist from uh, January 9th, 1988, uh, uh, and it says in there, get ready for world currency, and you open it up and it says pencil in the phoenix, for the year 2018. So that's 30 years in advance uh, that they're looking at it. And so uh, that's what would happen. Uh, Jeb Bush would try valiantly to, you know, stem the downward slide, but it would not be possible. And so uh, what would happen is we'd have this world currency, which is pretty much the last straw in terms of uh, undermining uh, in- individuals and, uh, and nations. And so what would happen is there'd be an election in 2016, uh, Jeb Bush would be elected, then he'd be, unless he really screwed up, uh, re-elected in 2020, and uh, he would begin, the next president would begin their office in 2025, uh, the year uh, by which Luciferian occultist Alice Bayless, ba- Bailey proclaimed the, quote, World Federation of Nations would be taking rapid shape, uh, according to what she called the plan. She kept writing over and over the plan, the plan, this, that, and the other. And in the first part of that chapter, uh, I outlined the political and economic aspects of the World War of, of the Paralites activities over hundreds of years uh, using a dialectical process. And the, the Paralites could not achieve ultimate success, though, uh, unless they could shift the values. See, the values are the key. You have to shift the country's values, and then you can pretty much get them to do whatever you want. So they determined that they would have to shift the values of the people away from the values expressed in the uh, the Holy Bible uh, towards those uh, from the Bible towards the philosophy of the secular humanist uh, today. And so that would be a good uh, stopping point that uh, we can pick up next time with Adam Weishaupt of the Illuminati. All right, fine. Well, I guess it's been Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Dennis, we always appreciate having you with us, and we'll look forward to having you back again next week at the same time. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.
Well, this is Dr. Stan, and we do hope you enjoy the conversation with Dr. Cuddy. Now, we do have his book, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. We have the uh, book he's talking about now, uh, The Power Elite, uh, uh, their their goal, their future, and it's available uh, by calling 1-800-548-927. We have other books by Dr. Cuddy in print, uh, all those that are in print, uh, certainly his book on the road to socialism, his book on quotable quotes, and uh, certainly on Operation uh, Rescue. Anyway, give us a call at one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven and ask for the books. Of Dr. Kennedy's are in print, but if you're only got to get one or two, get the Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan and the Power Elite. Uh, their uh, hope in their future and then of course uh, we carry some of the books Dr. Cuddy talked about we carry the book written certainly back in 1911 by Colonel uh, Edward Mandel House called Philip to Administrator we have David Rockefeller's memoirs written in 2002 where he talks about the secret cabal that he belongs to that rules the world and as he says, you know, well, people are critical of us, but, I mean, how would they have changed? Look how we've changed the situation in China and India, and that's absolutely right. We've raised the living standards in those countries, but, of course, in the process where we bankrupted America, and America is going to be destroyed, but that's exactly what they want. We have an elite that cut rules America, and they're loyal is not to America, but to the globalist dream. So, basically, we do hope that many of you out there want to get the various items we have. We we have a four C- CD set on secret societies. We have a four C- CD set on the secret government that actually contains an interview with Professor Carol Quigley, who was Bill Clinton's mentor, where he talks about the secret society that rules the world. That's the secret government, the secret societies, or the secret uh, 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 society special. That is actually three, four CD sets. We, they're available by calling one 800 548 You need to go to our website, RadioLiberty.com, and pull down the list of all the the items we carry and listen to our DVDs or listen to our radio programs. You can hear them live four hours a day there and certainly archived 24 hours a day. We hope that many of you, of course, will certainly uh, read our newsletters. Your job is to tell others about what's going on and let them understand that behind everything are powerful, sinister spiritual forces, truly demonic forces, intent upon bringing about a world government as was prophesied thousands of years ago. Our telephone number, 1-800-544-8927, 1-800-544-8927, our webpage, radioliberty.com www.radioliberty.com and then if you're you're in a position to help us we'd love to hear from you we have to uh, actually pay for uh, our program being on radio stations in those areas where we are on Uh, for instance this hour we probably have close to 15 outlets of one sort or another why of course it's an expensive proposition but we do this because of course if we lose America we lose everything our job is to try to get as many many people informed as we can and hopefully God will use the people who are informed in some way to mitigate the uh, terrible future that lies ahead if these wicked and evil people from these satanic organizations are successful in their effort to bring about a world government so basically we hope you'll go to our website again radioliberty.com and that you'll certainly get our material from there that you'll uh, certainly uh, encourage others to listen to our programs and that you'll join the Radio Liberty family of supporters, subscribe to our newsletter, certainly get our monthly tapes, we put out a four CD set and then of course that you'll certainly pray for America pray for revival, pray for our leaders and our ministers but please pray for Radio Liberty for our provision and protection because we're on the front lines of a truly spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization and there are powerful spiritual forces aligned against us and we'll be back tomorrow on Monday at the same time.